Forestry Commission meeting for February 2nd, 2022. Uh, all of the members are present. Uh, we have a, we have a, a guest, uh, Barbara Devlin, who is from uh, the Northampton Rotary Club. And she's here to talk to us about uh, their in-service day, proposed in-service day. So if it was okay with the majority of the commissioners, I'd like to take things a little out of order if possible. Um, if everyone's okay with that, um, and have, uh, have Barbara speak to us about their in-service day and then we can revert back to the beginning of our um, agenda. Uh, okay. and Molly is here, okay. All right, uh, welcome Barbara. Um, welcome to the Urban Forestry Commission. Uh, meeting. We're looking forward to hearing from you and very curious about the in-service day um, that the the uh, Western Mass Rotary and I guess you said uh, uh, Northern Connecticut Rotary Clubs are all kind of putting on together. Right. Yeah. Each each club can choose their own project. Our club chose to focus on tree planting. So um, and I'm really very happy to um, have the opportunity to meet with you today. Um, uh, this is all, all the communications have gone very quickly and I, I'm really pleased that we were able to schedule this so quickly. Uh, what I'd like to do is to speak pretty briefly to the, um, I think you all should have received an overview of the project, um, but I'll kind of walk through that, but I'm hoping that um, part of the 20 minutes could be for a little discussion uh, because there are some things that before we can really proceed to recruiting volunteers, we have to have some details worked out. So I'm hoping at least I can figure out whether the uh, Urban Forestry Commission is interested in working with us on this and, um, and then uh, what the next steps would be to to move ahead. But um, as indicated in the overview, the Rotary, Rotary International, first of all, is it's in over 300 countries around the world. Um, there are about 2 million, uh, oh, there, there are 2 million Rotarians at least in, in uh, these 300 countries. And so the international president has challenged every club across the globe to do a day of service project. So, um, and in our uh, Rotary clubs within, we call it Rotary District 7980, that consists of Connecticut and Western Massachusetts, um, they, the district settled on April 9th. So that's the reason why that day is scheduled and every club is asked to do uh, a project that day. Well, one of the new areas of Rotary International's focus is protecting the environment, which includes planting trees and protecting forests, that kind of thing. And so our club um, decided we wanted to do a project that focused on tree planting within the city of Northampton. And um, we you know, we could, we, I think we could generate some limited funds to contribute toward costs of trees, but we were hoping that, uh, that it wouldn't depend on us to raise the money, that there would be a budget that we could get trees to plant, then simultaneously we would try to raise some additional funds to put into the tree fund. Uh, but we thought our primary focus we wanted to be to try to uh, get volunteers to help with the tree planting. And um, so we were going to start out with club members, uh, but there's some of our club members that are pretty elderly and, and uh, can't really get out there and do physical, a lot of physical work. So we said, okay, let's get members, family, and friends. Uh, let's reach out to Northampton High School, to Smith Vocational uh, Technical School. Um, and then to other organizations, other civic and community organizations that we thought might be interested. So potentially, I think we could have quite a few volunteers that would be available to help on that day. Uh, and what we would do is our hope would be we would work with the city of Northampton to figure out how many trees, where should they go, 
uh, how many volunteers would we need in order to get that many trees planted on that day? And what would be a reasonable schedule that we could set up? Um, I am aware from um, Richard that um, you that previously the Urban Forestry Commission has had a tree planting on um, uh, Arbor Day, I guess it is. And so I thought, well, maybe there's already sort of a plan in place for what you can do in a day of tree planting. Um, so as um, a member of the club, I volunteered to coordinate this project. So um, I would be the representative of the club to, to work with you. And um, Susan uh, and Rich have all, I guess you're the designated people that I'll be working with and I'm delighted to do that. Um, but once we can make those logistical decisions and so that I know what I can, what I'm trying to recruit for um, and how many spots I'm recruiting for, then I'll really proceed in earnest to reach out to these other organizations and, and start recruiting. Um, one thing I will, we will also do is that, um, because I know we have some members that would not physically be able to plant trees on that day, so they might wanna make a donation. And I thought, well, we can put on our website uh, we can put an appeal for anybody who's interested in supporting the day of service uh, if they want to sign up to volunteer or if they want to contribute toward the purchase of more trees. We'd have them make a donation to the Northampton Rotary Foundation so we know what kind of impact we're having, but then we will turn around and take that amount and donate it to the uh, Northampton Tree Fund. So um, our hope is that as we recruit volunteers and generate enthusiasm for that day, we'll also generate interest in, um, oh, wow, I can also contribute to trees if I can't physically help on that day. So that's it. That's the idea in a nutshell. And um, I'd love to hear your reactions and ideas and, and specifically to find out what you think it would be possible to accomplish on that on one day. Um. Hmm. Rich, do you want to jump in at all or? Uh, so Barbara, thank, you very thought... much, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for coming to our meeting tonight and actually this wonderful uh, collaborative partnership that I think we're going to be able to capitalize on. Um, I, I think, um, the logistics, I mean, the, the only logistical problem that I would see is the day of, is the weather. It's usually, you know, the beginning of April can be very tenuous. We can, it can be balmy and 80 and it could be uh, minus four and lots of snow. So that the, that's the only problem. And, and that, that driver too also drives our ability to uh, get trees that early. Typically we don't plant until the week of Arbor Day. Um, so that might be, that might be, the, that's really the only problem that I see. I, I don't see us having a problem getting trees, providing the weather's fine. We have two reliable sources. One is in upstate New York, one is in uh, Hadley. Um, so I think it's really just about trying to match the, the, day, the planting day with the planting locations, which will then turn around and basically tell us how many trees we can plant. And then we can backfill with volunteers. Although I am not the volunteer expert, that would be Sue. Uh, Sue uh, is also a member of Tree, North, uh, uh, Tree Northampton, which is a nonprofit that manages all the volunteers that we, uh, that we utilize to help plant trees in, in Northampton and, and actually other places as well. So I, I don't see it being a problem. And this is, why, this is kind of why, why I wanted to fast forward you to come to this meeting. I'm glad you could make it because we even though we have kind of a heavy agenda, this is an important lift that we need to try to figure out logistically early on, because you're correct, we do have uh, Arbor Day events and we, we typically do um, a planting during Arbor Day week, and it's usually about 60 trees. Uh, and then we also give away 500 tree whips in front of City Hall for two days. So Arbor Day week is a really crazy week, um, but we also are excited about planting uh, planting with the with rotary with the rotary club as well and trying to make it all work. 
that Arbor Day week. I can't remember what uh, what day that is. It's the last Friday. The Arbor Day is the last Friday in uh, in April, which I don't have the date in front of me, but it kind of coincides with uh, Climate Week or Earth Day, as right. well, Earth Day week. So we kind of do a whole week of plantings. Yeah, so it's the 29th. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank 29th you. 29th of April. Yeah. So, so, you know, depending upon how many planting, well, so it's the, logistically, and other people can speak to this probably as well, logistically speaking, the, the, uh, the best bang for our buck would be to have a large area uh, or a large area where we have multiple trees, where we can have multiple volunteers plant at one time or clusters of that such. So if we send people off with 10 trees here, 10 trees there, 10 trees there, I mean, you could plant a lot of trees in one day, uh, providing you just have enough uh like crew leaders or um, people to make sure that the trees are being planted properly. Cause I would imagine that some of your members probably don't plant trees, but if you're, if you're, but also, but if you're reaching into like Smith vocational, um, we may be able to grab some, um, some people from the uh, forestry uh, section of the school. And we've worked with a lot of different, uh, we've worked with Northampton environmental club. So they have some planting experience. So um, I think that, I think it's doable. I think it's just a lot. It's just logistics. I think that logistics and the weather. So I'm, and I, I don't see an issue with us getting uh, purchasing or being able to get the trees. We, we are allocated fifty thousand dollars every year from the city's capital budget um, for tree uh, for tree planting. So we have some. We have room in there to add more trees this year. Uh, I will. Uh, I have a meeting with the district, uh, the Rotary District to uh, of all the people that are leading up these projects. And one thing I will ask them, you know, I'll just say if, if there's a weather, you know, if we're doing an outdoor project and there's a problem with weather, could we have a rain date? And if they say yes, then what we could do maybe is if I know what day, if you're gonna be doing tree planting on April 29th or something, I mean, I could designate that Arbor Day to be the rain date if if that would be helpful, um, if they'd let us do that. Um, unless you'd rather have another day closer. I, to I, I think I would prefer to have like the Friday before Arbor Day. Okay. Um, only because um, uh, Arbor Day week is very hectic uh, for all of us and logistically moving the trees from where they are housed in the nursery to actually the sites and prepping them all is, uh, is a lot of work. So, um, and I think that Friday before Arbor Day is Earth Day this year, I think. So that would actually be uh, a great um, rain day unless someone else has anything else they wanna add. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, so Rich, these trees are pretty likely to be bare root trees. So if there were a rain day, I think it would be better to have it be the 16th you know, which is a week later, because so okay. we'll hold them over that long. All right, let me uh, let me just hold on a second. I've got to move my screens around here so I can see the calendar. So uh, just uh, on the twenty second is a Friday. That's Earth Day, and then the fifteenth is uh, just so people know is Passover. So I don't know, you know, that's a Friday. I don't know. So that makes the seventeenth. That's like Easter weekend. Just yeah. so people know that the fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth. Oh, that yeah, that I don't think that's Easter it, weekend. It needs to be. I want to ask Barbara. Is it, it's best if it's a Saturday, or can it be a different day? I think it really needs to be a Saturday. Just if we're going to get volunteers that normally work or go to school, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So uh, we'd have to do it on, on a Saturday. Well, then I think the 16th would be the, as Rob suggested, would probably be the best rain day because if we if we do uh, all bare root tree stock, um, basically bare root tree stock, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's, a root, it's tree stock that has no soil on it. So there comes bare root, uh, and there's only a, there's a, uh, a time frame that we can hold them before they, the root systems dry out. So if we were to get a large bare root order, um, though a few days before the ninth, we could hold it 
until the 16th with no issue and the trees would uh, likely uh, succeed in planting. Uh, so I think the 16th works for, it works for me. And right. I, you know, unless someone else has an objection to that day, we could, Barbara, you could ask if we could make that the rain day. What do you, when you do your um, Arbor Day planting, um, when do you usually start and when do you usually stop? And how do you, or, or is this something Sue could follow up with me on? Uh, so I'm not taking your agenda. Plan, I but. can jump in. We usually start at nine in the morning, but um, there has been some flexibility. It is around um, Rich who manages the DPW crew and there's a lot involved there. I did want to introduce Rob Postal, who's on this call and spoke a moment ago. Um, Rob is a key person as well. He's uh, president of Tree Northampton, and he is um, a super volunteer in Northampton. He's been involved in planting 2,000 trees and around there, and um, really is hands down, like on the boots on the ground person. So I um, just want to make sure you see Rob's face and know because you're going to hear his name come up. Um, as long as they're okay with the rain date, I think that's a great idea um, to do the 16th, even though it's sun Easter Easter Saturday, I guess, the 16th, the rain date. Um, it's also can be kind of muddy and the soil can be very compacted early in the spring. If you garden at all, you might be familiar with that. Um, and of course, being they mentioned um, finding a place where we where we can do multiple trees in one place, so that um, we have adequate supervision, so the trees survive. I have a just a comment about where we might plant them. Um, so uh, when Barbara was speaking, introducing this whole project, she mentioned that. Um, the Rotary Club or, or she might be interested in uh, helping find sites for the trees or thinking about what sites we would plant? Well, we're, we're, we're actually um, willing to defer to the city and or we thought maybe the schools as well, uh, you know, they might have on their properties, they may have places for any public locate. I think we were more leaning toward public locations, but so, so let me um, just let you know about one of the crucial shortages we have. So we have pretty good supply of trees that Rich mentioned, and we have a pretty good supply of people who help us plant the trees. Um, and so things are going okay. What we are most needing, I, I think personally, and I've been planting a lot of trees as Sue mentioned, is we need more uh, large scale private sites that are within 20 feet of public right of ways. So that would be uh, any place that uh, is owned by anybody that has anything to do with the, the Rotary uh, Club that you can contact. If you can think of like a, a lot or a business that they have where there's lawn, is we can plant that as a public activity and make them public trees. Um, it's called a setback program. So, so there's an actual program, we do this regularly, but um, getting those businesses to um, allow us to plant trees, that would be a huge, mm. uh, really important step in terms of um, the Urban Shade, Urban Forestry Commission, Tree Northampton, which I'm part of both of those two things, uh, and the DPW joining together with private landowners because the public land is mostly the space between the, the curb and the sidewalk. That's most, that's where we plant an awful lot of trees that line our streets. But a lot of streets don't have uh, tree belts. They don't have any soil between those two. And so there are private owners that do have um, soil in front, of their, in front of their businesses. So just, I just want to add that and uh, we can work on this later, you know, not right now, we need to move along, but that's probably that's yeah. important. Uh, Rob, if, if somehow you could, uh, I, Rich could probably give you my email address and, and uh, 
if yeah, if we knew where some of these locations were for the names of businesses within the Rotary Club, maybe we could yeah. communicate with those businesses. Yeah, Rotary Club Northampton, right? There's a separate list probably for Northampton. Yeah. We've talked about this barrier for a long time. So we're excited with the idea of forming some relationships with the business community. Molly, you were gonna try to say something. Yes, all this time, I've also been thinking about setback plantings. And um, just to say, make it clear, it doesn't have to be a business. It can be a resident, a house, a home. Um, also, and, and it's what it is, it's um, not on the public right of way, but it's beyond the right of way, like beyond the right of way within 20 feet of it. So it's on somebody's yard, um, but within 20 feet of the public right of way. That's what it is. And it, there's a permanent kind of um, legal arrangement that happens um, with that landowner to make it um, in the deed that it's a public tree and the city will take care of it. We can give you all the details about that, but I was thinking this would be a great opportunity for Rotary Club members um, to either have setback trees planted in their own yards mm -hmm. or um, say they could organize on their street and get like their neighbors to, you know, to, they could talk about the setback program and they could be what we call setback ambassadors on their street and, um, you know, talk to their neighbors and explain the program and see if other people would be willing to have those setback trees planted. So a highly visible site that you drive by, I'm sure all the time, where this took place was the Gazette. So in front of the Gazette, there's two rows of trees. One row might actually be in the public right away, but the second row is certainly on private property. And it's just, it's a beautiful little piece of entry to the city. We want to repeat. Mm -hmm. Another place was uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Yeah, that we we did this whole planting along the uh, Elm Street side. The Gazette was an Arbor Day project, and Cooley we did in a fall one of the falls. But it was a wonderful partnership. Just working, getting to know our institutional leaders, and working with them. And some of them were out planting, and it brings the community together. I love uh, Molly's idea, the setback ambassadors. That's really wonderful. That is a big, again, a, it's been an um, ongoing barrier for us with our limited time administratively to interact and form these relationships with, with private landowners. And the setbacks allow a larger place for the roots Mm -hmm. They don't do well in the little strips of land, but when they're in a yard or a little more space, they can spread their roots out further and they're healthier and safer and better. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, that more information on that would be very helpful, I think. Um, so I'm conscious of your time, but um, we can... We'll just still schedule it April 9th, but then we'll one we'll publicize it with April 16th as a rain date in in case of inclement weather and and it just rain would make it not we wouldn't be able to plant in rainy weather right <laughs> or probably snow either. Um, <laughs> so all right we'll have that as a as the backup and um, and then. Um, I don't know if Rich, you could maybe, if you have ideas of places where you think tree, you've got trees and you'd like them planted. And it sounds like, uh, well, it depends on the number of volunteers, but if you've planted 60 trees in one day before, I would think we should be able to do that much. <laughs> It, it, it was 60 trees in a week, so it took several days. In a week, okay. In, in a day, we can plant about, I don't really have a firm number, Rich might, but 25, 25 trees. 25 to, 25 to 30 with the, yeah. with the present um, volunteers that we have. So, you know, that's with basically two people working on a tree together just because of, uh, just because of the pandemic. We try to limit the amount of exposure, you know, the time frame. Um, and we, we typically use trees that are either bare root or grow bags, so they're much lighter to handle. 
-hmm. so you can actually move faster. And it's a, a large B and B tree, which is a big ball and burlap tree. weighs a lot. It takes three or four people to wrestle it in a hole. So, I mean, we we have we have time <clears throat> we have time to uh, to put this all together for sure. It's good that we met. I'm going to email you. Um, we have a, what they call a setback brochure. It's a tri brochure that you can just download and take a look at, and it really kind of explains the setback planting program um, that we uh, we are definitely encouraging because we are running out of tree belt space and setbacks, as everyone has alluded to, are really, um, we really need more setbacks in places where there's no city property to plant trees. Uh, so I'll, I'll email that to you. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to, uh, to email me back. Um, I, I did not, I'm not including the whole commission on this email just because I don't want to mess up the open meeting law uh, deal. So I just put Sue on it for now. So um, we have to, we, we have, I'm, I'm keeping Rob updated. I okay. think that's allowed. It's not anything we're going to nope. deliberate on or make a decision nope. as no, nope. no, not at all. Um, because Rob is key to yep. like, because yeah, we, we need, we're limited by the number of leaders we have because you need a leader for each tree that's planted. So it's proper depth. So the branches aren't sticking out in the street where they're gonna end up getting cut off. So there, there's some, su supervision is important for each tree that goes in their public resources. We wanna make sure they're planted properly. But thanks, Rich, I didn't mean to cut you off. So you'll include, you'll copy me and then I can make sure that Rob's in the loop and anybody else who wants to be, of course. Yeah. Uh, Dave, Dave, I just want to get, David, you didn't have it. You didn't, you sent us an email, Rob and myself. Is there anything that you wanted to touch base on that email before? Or do you want to just kind of leave that? It's a logistical email internal and just. I, well, I think I, I suggested uh, uh, planting at the elementary school. Um, at least uh, there are four elementary schools, and um, I think there's an opportunity to do some significant tree planting. Mm -hmm. So that might be one uh, good place to land on on April 9th. But uh, Barbara, I, I did have a question. How is it going to be like 50% Rotarians and 50% um, uh, community volunteers from the high school, or more like 20, 20 80 or how, what's um, and, how, and how many total do you, do you expect? Well, I, I, I think we could generate a fair number of volunteers. I mean, the, the club itself is not huge, mm -hmm. but in terms of pretty physically active, you know, vibrant people, I would think they're probably like at least 15 in the club, but they could, then others might be able to get family members who, you know, are physically active. And um, the youth commission said that they would, they're interested and they would recruit within their commission or within Northampton High School. And um, uh, Mike uh, Cahillane, I think it is, he's a, on the trustees for the Smith Vocational, said that he uh, would connect me with their horticulture or forestry program. And, and um, I did actually look up a lot of that information online, but I mean, potentially we could have a fair number of volunteers, but um, if, if you wanna limit the number of volunteers, I'll adjust accordingly, <laughs> so. Let's talk online a little bit more if we were doing 25 to 30 trees, how that will play out in the number of volunteers and supervisors, because we'll bring the supervisors and we can do that um, behind the scenes. Right. And we'll get you a number pretty quick. Okay, great, great. So if there's nothing else you need from me, I'll sign off and let you finish yeah. the meeting. <laughs> welcome thank to you stay, very, but thank you very much. Thanks for recording it. All right. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much for yeah, thank uh, you. getting in touch. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see. Let's go back in order again, if everyone's okay with that. Let me just find my agenda. So I sent out the uh, minutes. Um, does anyone want to take some time to read them so we can approve them? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Rich, when did you send those? 
Uh, this afternoon. Okay. Around 1.30. I see. <clears throat> yep, got him. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm done reading. I am too. Yep, all done. Is there anybody who still needs more time? <clears throat> We're already rich. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to accept the minutes? As... I. Yep. I have a typo in there. Uh -oh. um, this is by January twenty first, two thousand twenty one. Ah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we didn't even catch it. I didn't catch it either. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, can I have a motion uh, to accept the minutes as amended? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as amended. May I have a second? 
It's second the motion. All right, there's a, sec uh, a motion and a second on the floor. Any discussion? No discussion. Okay, Deb, could you uh, roll call vote, please? Badly, sorry. Rich? Uh, yes. Susan? Yes. Yes. Jen? I abstained because I was oh. not at the meeting last week. Sorry about that. No. Nope. Rob? Sorry. Yes, approved. David? Yes. Molly? Yes. And Marilyn? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to recognize there is uh, someone from the public here, uh, Vicki Vicky Vance. Vicki Van Z. Vicky I Van just Z. noticed. Hi, Vicki. I just wanted to know if you wanted to say hello or you were just listening. <laughs> Vicki <laughs> organizes Saturday volunteers or, or for Tree Northampton. Or you've walked away from your device. Okay. Hi, Vicki. Welcome. I, I just unmuted myself. I just figured it out. <laughs> okay. Well, later. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. Welcome. Um, all right. So let me, I'm all over the place today. I've got a lot to talk about. Uh, so I do not have, um, the only thing that I have to report from the chair or the tree warden is that I did do, uh, I did review um, the 25% design plans for the Main Street redesign. Uh, and basically uh, what I reviewed were the planting locations, um, the potential plant, the potential species that were put in the plan. Uh, I had probably like four pages of comments about different things. Um, and I, I don't wanna go too deep into it tonight because we have other things to talk about, but I'd like to actually um, send uh, or have a discussion at some point in the near future uh, maybe the next meeting or the meeting after about what my comments were. Um, but a 25% design was basically talked about tree tree locations, um, the uh, tree protection diagrams in the back, uh, the specifications, tree planting specifications, and the proposed tree species. And all over the document and all over the emails that I received from uh, Tool, where, you know, constant uh, messaging about collaboration with uh, the Urban Forestry Commission to pick the appropriate species. And um, the other thing was that the uh, growing medium um, was kind of fluid because they are they don't have to have the actual uh, cubic uh, feet. At this point, um, they're still working on um, the specifications uh, and the cubic, the cubic volume, the volume for the material, whether it's gonna be CU soil, silver cells, et cetera. So that, that's not part of the 25% design. So now we have, um, you know, a whole nother year worth of discussion and design work on the project. But my, my comments were basically, <clears throat> I talked about holes in the canopy that existed that I think we have all seen uh, from the original plan, uh, especially in the upper end of Main Street by New South Street. And there were locations uh, in certain spots on Main Street that I was questioning why they couldn't actually plant trees. Um, so I, I made a whole bunch of comments. I haven't received any back. So when I get them back, I probably will, that would be the part of the time to have the discussion. Uh, I don't have any public, uh, there's no public shade tree hearing scheduled. Um, and that's all, I don't have much. Anybody have any questions? Rich, did you uh, have a chance to uh, complete or follow up or whatever on that tree that I asked you about on uh, near the high school at the corner of, uh, I can't remember the name of the street. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Vernon Street, corner of Vernon yeah. and Washington Place. I will get yeah. I will take care of that. Okay. In an email to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, the guy just keeps asking me about it. So. <laughs> okay. All right. That's that's okay. That's what happens. Yeah. Um. So we have um. The STO discussion. So I re we received, or I received uh, comments from Sue, put a nice draft together about the proposed changes from our last meeting that we talked about. And then David made some comments. So I'm not sure how you would like to, you want, you want me to, for example, would you like me to open up David's email so you can read it? Or how do you want to discuss the, how would you like to discuss this? So, all right, Sue, you think you had your hand up. 
Yeah. Oh, I just put thumbs up. If you want to show David, jump right into what David's thoughts were. Okay. Um, he's the one who's sort of put out thoughts. All right. Let me, uh, let me get David's email. I just sort of typed up what we talked about. Okay. Let me see if I can screen share this. I think there's some uh, <clears throat> there's technical questions, but there's also some uh, philosophical questions that in David's email uh, I think are really interesting that we should discuss. Mm. So I agree. Me, Thank you, David, for pulling back out and thinking of things more broadly, mm -hmm. which is hard to do when we're looking at word by word. Well, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for being open to it. Right. So this is. Um, the email that uh, Sue sent out that basically captured all of our uh, comments that we had uh, about the existing draft that we got back from planning and sustainability. Um, and let me know if you want me to scroll up or stay here. It's entirely up to you. Speak up a little bit, maybe. How hard is it to change the name of an ordinance? Um, it's like any changing any, any other uh, you know piece of language in the ordinance. There's the whole process that we have to go through. So if you're going to change the name, you should change it while you're changing the other things that you want to address. Hmm. Sort of like when they changed uh, changed our name from uh, Tree Commission to Urban Forestry Commission. Well, I like the idea of say tree protection ordinance. Has anybody else thought about it? Does anybody else have an idea? Does that have other implications or? No, I'm gonna scroll up so David can go through his email. Yeah. That's okay, everyone ready for that? Mm -hmm. All right, David, do you wanna discuss your thoughts? Uh, yeah, well, just that I, I think, uh, you know, the. The STO is shorthand for something that we all understand. Um, if, if we were to make the changes that the planning and sustainability is uh, suggesting, I don't even know how we would refer to <laughs> what they're suggesting as the tree, what the tree replacement ordinance are. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I do think that it's I think it's important to to kind of uh, foreground the fact that this the STO is about protecting old, older, bigger trees for a host of reasons. Yeah. And significant has, like now it's called STO, significant tree ordinance. Right. But the significant is a, as we keep coming up against, what does significant mean? It's so subjective. Whereas tree protection ordinance, it's very clear. I think uh, that was a brilliant idea, David, the language there, tree protection ordinance, because it's um, common language that anyone is going to be able to access. It's very accessible and it's clear. You know, what is this? You know, I mean, a significant tree ordinance could be a historic tree or, you know, where this is like, OK, we are, you know, it's I, I think it's. Um, much more accessible even than tree canopy replacement because that's kind of like you know what does that mean you know who who's who has to do that this is you know it, it's very laser focused i think i think it's an excellent excellent suggestion yeah and i think just the philosophically it, it the language is different has a different feeling to it like it's about protecting trees rather than treating them as like mechanical parts that can just be replaced with another one.
Marilyn and Rob, do you have any feelings, thoughts? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I, I agree with what has been shared and appreciate your work on this, David. I think languaging makes a big difference in calling it what it actually is. It's, I, I think adds more uh, teeth. So yeah, I, I support that. So David, I'm just reading here, 20.1 different ordinances will have to be changed as part of the package. These ordinances don't relate to the STO. They're just in the same uh, bin, is that right? You're referring to the final paragraph of the email there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Based on the uh, well, that so were you? Did you attend that presentation by Carolyn about the about the STO? Um, no, no, about the form-based code. I didn't. Did anybody else besides David? No, I was just just trying to understand where we're at, and and so and 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 changing the name whether that relates to the other 21 ordinances. No. Mm, no, I don't think so. I mean, it sounds like from what David wrote, David, yeah. it's, it's changing that ordinance name. Not yeah, the no, the, the, it, the 21 ordinance thing is sort of separate from okay. getting into the weeds. I see. When it yeah. comes to the significant tree ordinance. Right, okay, yeah. Well, I certainly agree that the, the, the name is now a relic if we get our wish to change uh, the definitions of which trees we're protecting. And I think it would be good to do. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. I, I think um, our uh, public, shade tree, public shade tree rules and Public shade tree regulations is what we have as a local regulation that's tied in with our uh, tied in with the trench permit. Um, that doesn't say that it's um, you know it doesn't say it doesn't start off by saying tree replacement or tree mitigation or it, you know it basically says what it is. It's public shade tree uh, regulations. So I think calling it what what the ordinance really is, which is um, you know tree protection ordinance. Um, the only um, the only thing that I would say that might be a little sticky is that, and it's happened to me several times where people will call me or I'll get emails um, because they 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 want to know that they they have a tree they want to take down in the yard and they know we have a significant tree ordinance and they want me to come look at it and tell them it's okay to take it down. So that that's where the confusion lies, but I mean it hasn't happened a lot. I mean. I think really it's more about tree protection ordinance because that's what we're trying to do. We're basically identifying trees that are at a particular DVH and we are asking for them to be protected if they can be. And if they're not, then within the tree protection ordinance, there is uh, certain thresholds that have to be met for replacing them or protecting them or replanting them, et cetera. So, Yeah, I, I like it as well. So what point, there's the point about the name mm -hmm. and then the legislative findings and intent, basically tightening up the language of that statement, which I find all of that great. And then, um, the third thing it has to do with the revisions of Northampton's zoning. Is it zoning code to form based code? I don't know much about zoning. So um, that's a third thing, I guess. And then I would, I would just add that uh, trying to bring the STO into alignment with what's called Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan which is a 2021 document that incorporates that climate resilience and regenerate uh, climate res resilience plan and a bunch of other plans in a holistic way. 
Do we have a document somewhere that shows the STO with um, with the changes that we've made on it? Uh, the, the, the most recent one is the one that I sent you for the last meeting. Okay. So um, I, we can take these recommendations from this email and put them in a, in a clean, in a clean document. Or I could, or I could just amend that doc. I could amend that document that came from Planning Sustainability that was in Track Changes. Yeah, I'd like to see the Track Changes version to see like the, the old version and the new version, not just of David's additions, but the one, the other ones that we made. Is that possible? I I don't think we're gonna be able to get to the one that I can provide is probably the one that we amended originally. We went back to planning sustainability and one that planning sustainability sent back. They're not connected. They're disconnected oh. at this point. Hmm. So I can give I can I can look at our the one I sent out, which is a PDF. And the reason I sent it as a PDF because I didn't want anyone to accidentally because it's a shared document. Mm. Want accidentally to press a button and stuff disappear. Right. So I, I made it into a PDF, uh, and that's mainly to protect myself, not not you, but not not everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I can I can put something together for our and send it out to you to to look at. Um, and then but, uh, go hmm. ahead. Do we need to make a decision today, though? Don't we want to? We probably I should have asked for that earlier, maybe. Um, no, we don't need to make a decision today because this is not part of the form based code uh, that mm. uh, is going to be going in front of city council in the next few months. This is something that is plant as as Carolyn admitted in a meeting and also in an email that this is something the planning is not necessarily looking at changing. Um, the changes to the STO are really been pushed by us. Mm. Um, so I, I think it would be it's sort of on our timeline, not their timeline. Okay. Well, yeah, it would be helpful for me to understand the STO as it was and yeah. what the changes are that we made to it. But whatever, whatever extent that can be done would be yeah. helpful. I'm sending you the email that has them attached. It has the, S, the planning and sustainability changes and the draft that Rich distributed on January 11th. And so what's the relationship between those two documents? Are they sort of competing documents or is one pre um, preceding the other? So the, the planning and sustainability document is the most recent one that we received from planning that um, was in response to the one that we ah. drafted and sent to them. Okay, okay. So if the attachments don't come through, you could search by the date and find the email with those attachments. Okay. All right. Anyone else have any comments? So I think for the next meeting, we'll have a clean draft with these amended changes that are in here if everyone agrees and I'll put it in a draft form I'll get it to you before our next meeting so you can see it and then um, we can generate more questions or have more discussion on the overall document I think, unfortunately this is the only way we can do it um, you know so I think it's unless someone else has a different suggestion sounds great thanks Rich okay all right okay uh, stop sharing my screen. David, thank you for these suggestions. Um, well, thank you for discussing it. So, uh, Rich, going forward, let's say that Molly has an idea for how to improve the existing STO. Yep. Is, should, should she do sort of what I did, which is a, a one-way blast? One way. Yep. Okay. Yep, one way. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to flip this around quickly so you have two weeks or a week and a half to actually digest this. So if you have suggestions, mm -hmm. I can incorporate them into the document um, and then we can have that document for our next meeting. Great, okay. That works for everyone, okay? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome, no, thank you. This is a complicated complicated process and a lot of thought, it's just, you just can't make this stuff up like, you know, 
quickly. I mean, it's a lot of thought process that goes through this. And yeah. I, I sort of feel like sometimes we're like in the dark and we're kind of, you know, with our hands in the dark and we're, we're uh, trying to figure out exactly what we're touching. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we don't, we don't have, I mean, there's, there's other ordinances uh, throughout the state um, at, um, you know, at, at local levels, but not every ordinance is the same. Um, and not every uh, community operates the same way and who enforces the ordinances. And, it, uh, you know, we have, we have a very active uh, planning sustainability office and a planning board and a very active, um, um, you know, land use, uh, zoning use policies in the city. So, you know, as soon as we make changes, something else is going to come up because it's so fluid. Um, that's what I think we've discovered in the last five years. If, if you think about all the time we spent talking about zoning and regulations, uh, it's taken up a lot of the commission's time before I was a member of the commission. And yeah. like some, of, some of you others were members of the commission, you know, so Marilyn, Marilyn and, and, uh, and Rob and, and Jen can recall in the very beginning, we, we talked about uh, zoning um, changes for the um, large scale solar arrays. And we, we have, uh, mm -hmm. uh, are missing. We, we, we did the first draft of the second draft of the STO because the STO was in existence when we when the commission was formed. So we've been uh, we've been through this a lot um, and it just seems like it keeps evolving as time goes on. The more we learn, the more we realize, okay, wait, that didn't work. Um, we need to change that. That's why data is uh, super important, um, which I, I will also tell you that I'm, I'm going to be trying to work with the building inspector, uh, the building commissioner, and the director in April to try to talk about how to capture through the building permit process, um, just some information about how many trees are being removed in building projects, um, by right building projects. So we have some data that we can actually look back on in a year and say, okay, how many trees have we lost um, by construction by right? Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, in, uh, an elaborate inventory. It just has to say, just measure the tree, um, mark it out on a piece of paper where it was and tell us what the DBH is and what the disposition of the tree is. Is, is it gone? Is it still there? So we can identify if we truly have an issue with um, all these trees being removed uh, during in this by right construction. Separate from the STO, but again, it's data, which the STO, we're here now because it, there's data that's driven us to this point that we feel there needs to be changes. So it's the same thing with this other um, by right uh, zoning, so. Thank you, Rich. That's really terrific. I'm thrilled to hear that. Yeah, I don't know how I wanna manage the data. I think just in a spreadsheet. So I think that's probably the easiest thing to do um, and just go from there and just figure out because it's, you know. People get really upset when they see trees near, right next to their house coming out but it would be interesting to see how often this happens. It feels like a vacuum. We don't know anything. Well, that's, that's, that's it. And then you have, unfortunately, people are struggling to understand. Zoning is really complex. And I don't, I mean, I understand enough to, to be dangerous, I suppose. But, you know, there's that form-based code uh, documentation. I read it. It's like 102 pages long. And it talks about everything under the sun you can imagine. And yeah. A lot of the things I don't understand because I don't, you know, I'm not a zoning person, um, I'm not a planning person, but I do understand the tree part of it. And I would have to say that there are, that needs to be edited because it, it is not, um, some of the things in there are not correct. So I will be sending my comments to um, Carolyn uh, regarding those changes. It was put together by Dotson Flinker. Um, I mean, if you're interested, I could have Carolyn come and talk to us about it. If you want to, to hear from her directly, it's, that's entirely up to you all. I'll, I'll put that out there in an email. And, and David, do you think that would be helpful uh, for us to have her come and talk about the form base? Zoning? I do. I, I think it'd be very helpful. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say that at the uh, at Thursday's presentation, the Joel Russell, who has spent most of his professional life dealing with form-based code. He said, this is a great document, but it's very complex and it's and, and it needs to be better explained by the consultants who, who are working with Carolyn. So it's not, it, 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 it's not, it's not us. It's actually, it really is complex, hard to understand. 
professionals, even mm. professionals. So I think it'd be great to have Carolyn talk about, say, green infrastructure, or how does this relate to the... Uh, is, is it on the city website? Yeah, it is. And I sent, I sent you a link. I sent you oh. the document. I've downloaded it and sent it to you in an email. Oh, thank you. That you're welcome. You have it. If you don't have it, send me an email and I'll, I'll get you a link to it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's the, the landscape aspect of it is what we're interested in because of the, because of the requirements for tree replacement and street tree locations, because the form based code talks about um, the, the, basically the two downtown areas and how the streetscapes will look and what, um, People are, uh, you know, developers or someone who's de de designing a plan has to put where the buildings have to see it, the amenities, uh, how many trees have to be planted, et cetera. It is very interesting, but again, it's a lot of that document's very complex and very hard to follow because you have to understand the zoning code that we presently have and, and basically what what's in the zoning that we have that's missing. Um, and then a form-based code is, is, a, is a different type of zoning code that is in a lot of places in the country, I, 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 from what I understand. And so now they're basically taking that and, and making it sort of like a GIS layer. That's the best way to describe it. It's like a GIS layer. We're just going to shove it in there. And now it's another layer of zoning that we have um, that we're going to adopt. So uh, any other questions about STO or anything else before we move on? Okay, we are actually on time. Marilyn, are you proud of me? We're, I'm almost, we're three minutes over. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so 2021 planting update. <laughs> um, all right, so what I would like to do, I, I wanna share with you, um, this, and I haven't, I finished the two spreadsheets from 2020. 2021, and I'm going to share them with you if I can just get them to come up correctly. Okay, so let me just go to, hold on one second. Okay, so I know this is really small, and I, it's, um, I don't know if you can see it all, I hope you can. But we planted um, 240 trees in 2020. Uh, so that so what and what I ended up doing is I uh, put it all together. So you have uh, your total by species in this column, total by street, total by lot location, meaning uh, right away setback tree belt. Um, BL is border. Uh, I think BL means borderline, but that's not correct. That has to come out. Borderline's down here. Parking lot right there would be 12. For example, that would be the um, uh, senior center parking lot. Uh, total by planting type. And then uh, total by ward, which I think Molly, uh, I think everyone's interested by total by ward. So this is the breakout by ward for 2020. And then when I slide this um, over, this basically is all the data fields. Um, and then um, the dates that were planted. And these dates are close. They're probably a little off just because I didn't capture the plantings like I normally do for 2020. It was kind of, 2020 was kind of a blur. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then um, the trees planted in 2021, um, 314. And you can see that we planted, um, you know, by ward, it's broken down ward one through seven. And then all of the total by species, total by street, total by lot location, total by planting type. And then again, the same way, um, if you slide over, here is all the data uh, arranged uh, alphabetically by street and, um, so the, I, I didn't want to mess too much with it, but I have, you know, those four Barrett placed, uh, 32 Barrett. And I, as I, when I tried to mess with it to make it all in a line, it, it, uh, it didn't like me. So I, I, had, I had to keep moving this document from a Google Doc to a, to a Word Doc, but I wanted to make it a Google Doc so I could actually import it into our shared drive so you can mm -hmm. look at it. 
So my next um, order of business um, is going to be to go to um, this is the master water bag list of 2016, 2019. And this is kind of a little bit of a mess because uh, someone else was managing this for me. Um, that's not, it's not um, anyone's fault per se. It's just, it's not as um, neat as the other one. So basically between 2016 and 2019, we planted 1100 trees. And then um, in 2020, we planted 200, and 40, and then 2021, uh, we planted 314. So we're roughly around 1,700 trees. And then we have, then I have, I have a list for 2015 that doesn't exist in here that I'm gonna convert and make a tab just like um, the tabs I showed you previously. So we can actually see the trees we've planted since 2015, since the inception of the commission. So that I would say is probably like 112 trees. So we're probably pretty darn close to 17, 1700, 1730. Wow, Rich, this is beautiful. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been my, my, my eyeballs are really kind of swimming. Oh, I know. It's great yeah. though. It's interesting how it from year to year the ward, the numbers in the different wards change a lot. So you, one year isn't necessarily representative of a that, you know, that, 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 you know correct. You know. We move no. around. Right. For like on this list here, if you look at the there's no ward six. Mm. So that is um, odd to me why there's and there is a ward six. If you look right here. Right, there's a ward six there, there's a ward oh. six here, but it's not calculating. So I have to fix oh. this. I have That's to fix this. This is not, huh. this is the last piece of the puzzle, but I wanted to get this year and last year squared away. Um, and then um, going forward, what I'm going to do is I'm going to manage, and this is not really a database, obviously, but I'm going to manage it the same way. I'm going to, you know, for 2022, um, we will have a list just like this. And as we plant, the, as the trees leave the yard and they're on the trailer, I will put them in a the list um, and uh, we'll go from there. You know, this is not really, uh, another thing that I was hoping to do was to make another column over here um, in this area and actually try to capture, because we did talk a little bit at our last meeting about planting selection and about the uh, 10, 20, 30 rule. So it would be nice to be able to see uh, on paper easily um, what we've planted for uh, families, genera, um, et cetera, um, which I think would be helpful just to make sure that we are, which I think we are, we're, we're, we are carefully planting um, a wide variety of trees from different families just so we actually, and, and genera, so we act, so we, but we, we don't have, um, if this was all imported in Tree Keeper, I could probably do a pie chart with this. And the reason this is also built like this too is because then I can give Tree Keeper, I could give Tree Keeper the folks at Davy Resource with this data and they could actually put it into Tree Keeper. The only problem is it's not gonna be accurate because there's no X, Y axis um, spatially. So if we say nine Blackberry Lane, they're going to stick like all those trees right in the middle of Blackberry Lane, and oh. <laughs> they'd be like one, you know, wow. one, a couple, a whole bunch of dots right in one spot. So, uh, and I'll be honest with you, the amount of planting that we do, um, I don't have, I physically don't have the time to actually stand to every at every tree and actually enter them in Tree Keeper and actually get the X Y axis, which is done by. Uh, it's fun, but done by cell, cell phone or uh, uh, LTE. So it's easier for me to come back here and enter the data this way. Uh, and then we have to update the inventory another way. So. Well, it's a thing of beauty. And I particularly like to see it all together, the different um, 
different cultivars we're using, yeah. cultivars we're using. It's interesting. Yeah, that, so that's what's nice about the, um, um, the, this total by species. And, and every year, as, as uh, Rob and I and others have found uh, different um, subspecies and cultivar of different trees, um, you know, like uh, Schmidt, J.F. Schmidt produce, you know, actually does a lot of, of uh, cultivars of, you know, sh smaller trees, underwire trees. We've added, we've added data in, in this column. Um, You know, like look at the Gladitia, there's Skyline, there's Shade Master, there's uh, a Street Keeper, um, there's Sun Coal. So, we, you know, we planted all of these trees because in years past, you'll see there's um, other, this is why the data is in here because they are out in the street. We just don't have it all in one place. So eventually what I'd like to do is fix that document that's from 2016, 17, make a new tab that says 2015, and then put all of that data in one column like this, so we can see everything we've planted from 2015 to present. And then the ward list, um, which is over here, would be populated completely so you could see how we've mm. yeah. how, how we've done by how we've done by ward. I know you and Rob are so knowledgeable and you're always learning about these new cultivars. Where do you study that? Is that from information from suppliers or is there a site where you learn about the new cultivars um, as they come out? You know, for me, it's been a lot of communication with Rob. Um, it's been communication with uh, the two nurseries we use. It's also been, what's also uh, been helpful to be honest with you is um, the um, Citizen Forester. Oh yeah. The Citizen Forester always does a species spotlight. Um, it's, it's, Obviously, though, when Molly Freilisher was doing it, it came out once a month. Um, it's not going to be that way any longer. So you've got 12 species spotlights. Um, and, you know, she has a much more global look or picture of uh, other um, counterparts in other states and what they're planting. So that was helpful. Um, and then um, reading uh, Michael Durr's uh, The Tree Book has been another great... Which one? Uh, Michael Durr, The Tree Book. Michael Durr and... Um, Duren Duren Warren. It's called Duren Warren are the authors. It's called the Tree Book, and that has that was up to date uh, two years ago. So that has a lot of the cultivars um, um, that are interesting to us that have been developed based upon multiple many years of experience of growing trees in the urban environment, and that's been helpful. It feels like they've developed a lot of new cultivars as urban tree programs are growing. There's also a couple trade journals. Um, one is, um, oh geez, now I'm like, uh, uh, nursery management is one. I You might have to pay for that one. I'm not quite sure. Right. But sometimes if you, you know, are agree not to get in paper, they'll give it, you know, the, digitally, they'll get it for free. But there's also uh, tree service, tree, trees. Do you know that one, Rich? Tree services. You know, I'll make myself a note and try to go through. I used to use them in, in my deal. classes when I taught at the at Stick, and um, those are free because the advertising pays for it. But I'll, I'll um, often that's where I would learn about new you know, new varieties and stuff. And um, it's really cool. Like they have, they breed them so they don't have messy pods, and they yeah, sure. all kinds oh, of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, um, Molly, I wanted to ask you, do you, um, how much time do you need for your spotter lantern fly? Not really. I don't have anything really prepared. It's just um, one of those things where eventually we should decide what we want to do with this information that we're collecting. So um, let's say we, well, I guess I'm going into it already. Let's say five minutes. Okay. Right. <laughs> Answer your question. Okay. All right. No, no, that, that's great. I, because I wanted to give Jen a chance because uh, Jen sent me an email um, before the last meeting and she was unable to attend. But she just, and this kind of uh, dovetails right into the planting and future plantings. She wanted yeah, to sure. our, uh, our change in our um, 
planting practices where we're actually adding amendments. So she mm. required to talk to all of us because all of us plant in one form or another. And I think it's good information to have. So Jen, it's all yours. Yeah, you're up. Yeah, me to go? Not my, okay. I was confused. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't want to, um, you know, uh, I communicated with Rich because I wasn't on a lot of the plantings this year because of various things. And uh, but I did notice kind of consistently when I was on the planting sites, we're now amending soil, and that's kind of a new thing with biochar and with the fertilizer and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't mean to like point fingers or be critical of anyone, but it's just something I noticed was um, it seemed to me a lot of times uh, the amendments were going in kind of in the hole in layers. You know, and that's really not great. Uh, I I don't know the answer. I think we could talk with Tree North. You know, we could talk of Tree Northampton, and if there's some trainings we need to do or something. And but really, what should be happening is those amendments should be put on the pile of soil that we've dug out and put on a tarp mm -hmm. and seriously mixed in. It's kind of like you want if you're making chocolate chip cookies, you want to like mix those chips throughout the whole thing so every cookie has a chip because <laughs> some, particularly some of the some i teach high school okay <laughs> so some of the some of the um uh particularly i'll just give you a quick example some fertilizer elements are very immobile like phosphorus moves an inch a year mm. so if you've got a big blob of phosphorus, like over, you know, fertilizer that's only in like inch three and there's nowhere else, it's not mixed throughout. So even if, though, if it's soluble and, you know, gets in the soil water, which is the way it's taken up, it's only going to be available in a very minute area of the roots, which so... And same with the biochar and the compost. If we want the the to maximize the um, you know new information we've gotten, particularly about biochar and compost combo, then I just think it's super important to train people to mix. Really take the time to really mix all the amendments in the soil and then put them back. You know, as as fully mixed, not like layer them in there. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell how much of the soil we're going to put back. Right. 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 Yeah, I was going to ask the same question. So let's just say it's all mixed in with the soil that's on the tarp. And then some of that soil ends up being used sort of as as the rim. Um, is, is that problematic? No, eventually those rims kind of get broken down, right? And kind of get, you know, you they'll get over on the grass it's it's all good you know it's not wasted really you know and i'd be happy to you know put our heads together you know we don't have to do it right now but put our heads together with rob and sue maybe in tree northampton to figure out a, the most effective way do we target our leaders and just make sure that you know um we're really on top of that because we're like super on top of like the uh tree flare like we are like yeah. like doing fabulous in that arena and that's super important and i just would we're spending money on this stuff you know on biochar and fertilizer on the you know the crystals and stuff and i just think you know it's it's you know horticulturally um best practices, I guess, to really make Thank sure. you yeah. so much. Oh, you're, you're muted, muted, Rob. Yeah, I was talking to my mother. Um, so other than Tree Northampton, Rich and I have been um, talking about how the mix should be made. And it's not certain how, how we should handle all the materials. I mean, we got all kinds of, all kinds of issues how it should be done and, and including rich i think we're thinking about trying to amend the soil to some degree for some trees that are kind of struggling the newly planted trees that yeah so 
you know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for major change. And you know, we do, yeah, you know, we come up with some more new good ideas and, and enact them. You're talking about amending existing trees? Well, some of the trees we plant, even though it looks like they'll do all right and they don't die, they barely grow. And so uh, Rich pointed out on Prospect Avenue, no, Street, I'm sorry, Prospect Street across from Child's Park, there's a row of trees that um, some of them are growing very slowly. There's a couple of trees that are just like sprung ahead and Rich can speak to that. Those are the trees that when Greg Beck uh, came and gave us the presentation about biochar, um, he spoke about the trees that he just kind of uh, fertilized you know, um, and they are, they have double the amount of growth. Wow. Which, which is, uh, you know, obvious because you're fertilizing it, but you know, you're making, they're making um, organic soil amendments, liquid, liquid organic soil amendments that um, the tree, you know, does, did, they did, they were incredible. Huge. They were huge. I mean, they were twice as long. I don't even know. I don't have a picture, but I could, I went up and got out and looked at wow. them and see that, you know, their growth uh, in the, in the one year's time was twice that of the tree next to it. Yeah. Yeah. Caliper yeah. Tree. They've calipered up. So it's really an issue because what happens is if the trees go in and they don't grow fairly quickly, every year that they're very, very small is a year when they're really subject to right. serious damage. Mm -hmm. So getting them going is really, really important. Uh, and so we're something to think about. We do, Tree North Hampton does get from rich tree stakes and go and um, tree spikes and spike some of the trees with some fertilizer currently. I mean, and the tree spikes are good, but I think like Jen alluded to, it's like one glob of, you know, spike of, of fertilizer concentrated in one area where the organic uh, liquid application, you know, gets into the soil and um, goes into the whole area where all the fibrous roots are because they make multiple entry points. And so the tree actually is pulling up the nutrients all at the same time, all through the system. Yes, Molly. So those trees that you spoke about that are so different in size, was the difference between them just the biochar or lots of different amendments? No, what they did is they were they were they were fertilizing trees on private property, uh, and then they just they decided as an experiment without telling me, which was not supposed to do, but I'm happy they did it. They used liquid fertilizer, organic liquid fertilizer. It's the same fertilizer that we use in the in the granular form. Um, it's like an eight zero zero. Oh. They have so they have a liquid, and so they put it right into the. They injected it like with a T jet into the soil. Wow. So I mean, this this is a whole other like a whole other subject that we have to think about, I guess. And I don't want to belay this because I want Molly to get her phytoenergy fly update in, but. We have to think about the fact that now we've invested in like 1700 trees. So now there's all this plant health care mm -hmm. stuff that we have to think about that we, you know, we, we still have our, we still have our tree planting hat on, uh, which is great. And, but now there's a whole nother plant health care issue that dovetails into basically regular routine maintenance that is, you know, responsibility of the tree warden and the department of public works. But the question is, do we think more broadly about how we do plant health care um, after the fact, and is that something that we want to look at maybe getting done professionally and actually trying to find funds to make it happen where trees are fertilized on a yearly basis by um, some vendor that the city has a contract with? And this does relate also, I mean, that's why I didn't think it was a total tangent to Jen's issue of how we are delivering the biochar, because I do believe some people deliver what's called biochar tea. So it's necessarily okay. injected after the fact rather than do it during the yeah. yeah, they do. I mean, they, they air spade, again, they air spade holes and they fill the holes actually with biochar, um, organic leaf matter. Um, and they just let the, uh, the tree do its thing as it breaks down um, within the critical root zone of the tree. So I think it's something that we have to think about more broadly. I keep coming across arborist wood chips about how they have everything trees need. So, um, hmm. <laughs> And, and uh, subcontracting would be the logical, um, the logical uh, place to yeah. go for like uh, liquid feed rather than um, 
trying to we try to write a grant or go through the urban to to purchase a small unit that um so that that's a whole nother that's a whole nother subject and um i i have to determine whether or not fertilizing in the public right away is considered um under the auspices of similar to spray, using pesticides in the public right away mm -hmm. you have to make sure that there is uh that that does that it, the two don't dovetail together because if we need to use pesticides in the public right of way, for example, um, there is a whole hearing process, public right. hearing process you have to go through. So I, I don't think so, but you have to have a pesticide license in Massachusetts to do any kind of application. Hmm. So we, you have to have a, a licensed pesticide applicator, you have to have the rig, and then you have to actually set aside the time for a full time employee to right. do it. So plant health care, uh, in my opinion, is. Left best to the specialist or someone who's an arborist, yep. um, and I would think it would be it would be um, more consistent and done. Not, I'm not saying that we can't do it, but it would be yep. consistent and done correctly if we had someone that we hired to do, you know, ten thousand dollars worth of plant healthcare applications. Um, you know, Bartlett Tree does a lot of plant healthcare for us: air spading, root pruning, root invigoration, et cetera. So. Okay. Yeah, that's why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely something we need to think about it and we should think, put our thinking caps on about it. Um, but I would like to flip and get Molly in for two minutes before we have to go. <laughs> well, if you, if you can, Molly, I know Marilyn, I want to try to leave at six. So I, yes, um, I want to say one thing. Can you put those, um, those spreadsheets about the tree plantings on our folder so we yeah. can look at them or put a copy on there? I will, I, will put a, I will put a copy on there and then I'll send you all yeah. the information so you'll be able to look at it all. Okay, great. Um, as far as the Atlantis goes, um, we need to talk about what we're going to do with the data. Like, um, since nobody has actually done this thing of the trap tree method, um, as far as I know, it hasn't actually been done. It's just an idea. Um, and also, if we do get a a spotted lanternfly uh, reproducing infestation here. Suddenly, I think DCR kind of swoops in and does something, but I'm not sure what they do. The only thing it says we're supposed to do is notify DCR. Well, what are they going to do? I don't know. Um, I want to find that out. And like, what can we actually do? Can we actually get some of the trees cut down, um, especially the little sucker ones, so they don't grow up? Um, you know what's involved with you know talking with neighbor talking with the landowners and asking them if we can do it or can we just go in with some like clippers and just snip 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 those small ones um probably not <laughs> but anyway we need to talk about like what we're going to do with the data i think it's it's bound to be useful to know where the trees are but not specifically we don't know what we're going to do with that information I just a quick, quick yeah. comment. Just um, what, because this is a um, uh, like such a big threat. Probably what would happen is we would somebody would we have an infestation. You contact DCR, and then USDA and APHIS gets involved, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and just like they did with the uh, oh Asian longhorn beetle. Yeah, thank you, Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester. It's like, you know, I knew some people that worked on it. So it won't be like it goes on deaf ears. It has to go boom, 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 boom. There's a whole, because the federal government's involved at this point. So, yeah, I'm curious about that process and how much yeah. say we have in what happens and, you know, how can they use the data that we collect, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to talk about sometime. Well, we can, if you, I can. Put it for a longer time at our next meeting if you would yeah like. okay that would be great but maybe Mark, not very was rob trying experience. to say something oh i i, I don't know it was just about cut, how cutting them down probably isn't going to do much unless you can poison them they'll, they'll sprout back up i fought with them many times mm -hmm. yeah it's very it's complicated because we you can't uh until it becomes an infestation that's when all the bugs come off and that's the problem. It's uh, 
you know, I mean, you could say we were going to go down and cut all the, we're going to cut all the maples down because the threat of aging long-term beetle is here. You know, it's kind of the other way around. The pest shows up. And, um, and, and it's funny that in MGL 87, um, there is um, an, accept, an exemption in there for a tree warden um, and the proper officer, which would be the mayor in our, in our city, to remove trees that are infested with Dutch elm disease. Hmm. That's the only reference um, MGL 87 makes about any kind of pest, you know, so there, so it's really, it's very old. So if it's a public shade tree and there's spotted lantern flying it, I technically can't cut it down because it doesn't exactly, it doesn't mention the actual spotted lantern fly. Now, if it was a tree that had oh. disease, then I could just cut it down without a public shade tree hearing. But, All right, let's continue this discussion next yeah. time. But if you could put me maybe halfway up the agenda instead of at the end, that would yep. be great. Yeah, I, I, again, it would have been a little different, but Barbara was- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quickly, so I didn't want to miss that opportunity. So thank you for um, posting her this evening. I'm, I'm looking forward to it's really nice okay. to work with other volunteer organizations. Yeah, great. Uh, it really gets the message out. And it's nice to see that um, the Rotarians and others like them are actually thinking about climate change. Um, people think about it a lot more than I sometimes I think we think they do. Yeah. That if that came out right. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so I if anyone else have any comments before I call for a motion to adjourn? Can I just throw in that? Um, the Northampton Rehabilitation Center was sold this property and they're gonna be working on it. And they say they're gonna use the existing structure. There's some fabulous trees on that property. Um, so as a resident of this ward one, um, I'm gonna to try to follow it a little bit and pester my ward counselor to keep an eye on them. But of course it's private property, but there's some really nice trees there. Um, there's no reason for them to get damaged during the construction process, but there's no protection for them. Is that the building on um, Bridge Road? Bridge Road, yep. where, yeah, they're going to demolish it? No, they're not. They're going to use the stru existing structure. Oh, that's good. That's but they're going to have a lot of construction going on, and there's no reason to hurt the trees, but they might yeah as we know those trees are regulated by the sto because they meet the threshold requirements and they're not allowed to i mean under the law okay but st only only kicks in if they need a special permit right yeah but they will need a, a site plan won't they because aren't they changing the use oh, okay you know these things i don't well i i because i actually asked rob about this very site and he he educated me Oh, <laughs> but he might have been he, he might have been educated by Rich, so I don't know. So. Uh, no, no, I had nothing to do with it. Rob's on his own on this one. Well, he, think, Rob was a developer, so he knows a thing right. or two. But but I think but I think you're correct. It is gonna there is gonna be definitely because of uh, the amount of uh, traffic that's gonna be there. There'll be have to be a traffic study because it is gonna be individual units. So the the place wasn't designed um, to have uh, the patients that lived there didn't drive typically, so it only had so much interest to be into traffic. So, are you talking uh, about the place Bridge Road, not Bridge Street? That place yeah. that's been sitting there vacant for years and years. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's going to be developed. It's uh, right oh. across from Hatfield Street, so yeah, it's going to be a nice project. Um, I think uh, it also will get the property back on the tax rolls for the city as well. What are they making it into? Um, they're going to be affordable living units. Oh, be great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so that's other community use, too. I forget what it is. So, Sue, that's a great little project for you to keep your eye on. That would be okay, awesome. Okay, I'll try to remember to. All right. I forget when the next meeting is, but. Okay. And then I will also reach out to Carolyn uh, and uh, just talk with her about trying to figure out a time for her to come and talk to us about the form-based code, if you would like as well. So I'll try mm -hmm. to figure that out. As, I'll try to get that on uh, our agenda. Okay. Great. Anyone else have any comments, questions? All right. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move to adjourn the meeting. May I have a second? I'll second. All right. Uh, that, that is uh, any objections? 
to the motion that's on the floor and seconded. No objections. Okay, could you show of hands, please? Uh, to adjourn. All right. Thank you all.